So now we're into the, the next afternoon session. Uh, this sort of represents the time that Mike moved from Berkeley, again, after conjo being cajoled by his wife, coming to here to MIT. Um, so we're going to have talks from uh, uh, Stan Zadonik talking about streaming. We're going to have talks from Sam to discuss his impact, Mike's impact at, in the New England Davis community. Uh, then we're going to have Andy Palmer talking about C store and column stores and Vertica. And then we'll finish up with. Uh, Magda and myself talking about what it's like to be the student. So if you have one last final announcement, if you have not turned in your Stonebreaker quiz uh, answered questions, this is your last opportunity. Uh, you can pass it to the side and when we come get it. After this, we'll be tallying results and we'll announce the winners uh, afterwards. So um, at this point, I'm glad, happy to introduce uh, Stan Zadonik. Um, Do we have any announcements? Anyway, yep. Thomas, do we have any announcements? Can you say something about your device? Oh, um. <laughs> Positive. 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 Uh, <laughs> he's a good man. Uh, <laughs> I'm sorry, what was the question? Okay. 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 Uh, yeah. There we go. Yeah, I'm sorry. Uh, yeah, he was looking up online. Uh, so we have an announcement from the MIT parking uh, services. Uh, there's a car outside that needs to be moved. Um, they were going to tow it. Uh, they told me to do this uh, after lunch. The license plate, it's in New Hampshire. It's Quebec, Unicorn, Echo, Lima, Four, Lima, India, Foxtrot, Echo. Um, if this is your car, please move it, because they're otherwise going to tow it. Thomas, is, is it on the website? Yeah, OK. Um, Oh, okay. Yeah, so is this, is this anybody's car here? Please, please, please move it. Okay. All right, so with that, uh, we're taking things over to my advisor, Stan Zadonik, who is a good man. Um, he showers daily. Uh, he's never physically abused me. Okay. Physically. Physically, yes. Stan, come on. Thanks, uh, hang on here. Let me uh, make sure I'm all in order. I have to apologize. I'm getting over a cold, so I have a little bit of laryngitis. So hopefully my voice will last. Is this the? Uh... Okay, well, it's great to be here. We're all having a good time. And uh, when Sam mentioned that we were going to have a party of sorts for Mike, I th my imagination went wild. I thought, party? Wow, I know. We'll have DeWitt jump out of a cake. <laughs> but you know, that's just my way of thinking. It turns out that if you hand over the duty of arranging a party to a bunch of academics and researchers, they basically redesign Sigmod. <laughs> And that's OK, because it's fun. We all like Sigmod. But it wasn't what I had in mind. Um, <laughs> OK, let me see if I can get this to work. There we go. So uh, turns out I've known Mike for a very long time, since the mid-'80s. And uh, we'll get to this move to the East Coast in a minute. But I'd first like to uh, digress to the early days that, when I knew Mike. And uh, basically, back in the 80s or so, the database community likes to do these uh, discussions, these two camps, these wars, right? So there was codicil and relations. And then there was a time when there was relations versus objects. And this is when I first met Mike. Uh, I was an object guy. You can guess what he was. Uh, so we would find ourselves on various panels or head-to-head uh, -head across the aisle from each other. And so these discussions would get a little heated sometimes. And uh, basically, you know, I would say things like, that, and Mike would res respond with that, <laughs> right? And so, you know, I was a young faculty member at the time. I was a little intimidated, and so uh, I figured that Mike hates me, <laughs> which he may well have, but he didn't show it. Uh, there's some guy in the front here that's jumping up and down. I don't know what that's all. By the way, I'm not sure what's going on with Mike's head. <laughs> But anyway, there was this guy here. The audience didn't often agree with us either. So there's this guy who basically <laughs> d 
didn't like either of us, thought we were all wrong, and uh, he said that data log will set you free. <laughs> and it wasn't until much later that I figured out this was Jeff Almond. <laughs> and uh, so, th so this was the context of, uh... and then, m miracle of miracles, we became friends. He didn't really hate me, and the major life lesson here from Mike Stonebreaker, or about Mike Stonebreaker, is that he likes a good fight. He's not going to hate you forever. He's actually going to appreciate that. So uh, I hope that's true. <laughs> <laughs> so basically around 2000, as you all know, Mike and the family got on an airplane. And they flew to Boston, I guess. Uh, I got a little carried away with clip art here. Sorry about that. <laughs> uh, and uh, I, I knew he had moved here. He moved to New Hampshire. And that, that was a good thing. And then one day. My phone rang. And uh, that's how phones looked back then, by the way. <laughs> uh, my, my phone rang, and it was Mike. And he was in New Hampshire, and he was feeling kind of lonely. He was looking for a playmate, and MIT, which was much closer, didn't really have much in the way of databases going on, I'm sorry to say. So uh, he suggested maybe we should get together, and maybe we would uh, do something together, have a project together. So. Uh, I went into MIT. We met on the fifth floor of uh, 545 Tech Square, and we talked for, for the afternoon. And uh, that kind of looked like that. And uh, yeah. And the miracle that happened is we, we concocted a project. And the project was about streaming. That's what I'm supposed to talk to you about today. Uh, now, many of the slides that I'm going to show you in the next bunch uh, come from uh, slides that are more than 10 years old. Uh, it was really kind of fun to go through these old slide decks that you hadn't seen in 10 years and s realize what you were trying to sell. Uh, and so, so please, they're old. I'm, these, these are historical documents. These are not new, new things to be uh, criticized. Is this like previous slides? <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, this was the way, this is an actual slide from, from the old days. Hard to say old days. It seems like just yesterday. But basically, the thing on the left was uh, how the, the world used to work. And we're going, to, we're going to change the world in the streaming context to look like the thing on the right. And I think it was Mike who came up with the term human active system passive, system active human passive. That's how I remember it. And, uh, this allowed basically the data to, to trigger events in the CQ engine, and answers would go to the user. The data was the active party. Okay? And so that led to Aurora. And this is the slide, the sort of the cartoon slide that we always showed to, uh, to tell you what Aurora was about. Basically, Aurora took a bunch of input streams on the left, passed them through a bunch of boxes or uh, transformation engines or uh, SQL operators, if you wish. And out the other end would come uh, uh, data that was uh, useful to these uh, applications. And you'll notice, see if I can do this, way up here, is that visible? A little green dot? OK. Way up here, there's this thing called a profile. And uh, that, ba that essentially expressed the quality of service that you wanted out of your system. Oh, and by the way, down here, there was some tip of the hat to historical, to historical data. Um, but we'll tell, say more about that in a minute. OK, so uh, the operators were your, your typical friends, you know, things that you might have uh, put in a relational query plan. Um, and we added a few extras like uh, W sort and resample. No need to go into that now. And also user defined uh, procedures or functions. OK. What's, what's this quality of service thing all about? There were things that the user would specify that would tell you what kind of, uh, of results you, you wanted to see. So for example, the one that we, we spent most of our time on is this idea that delay is, uh, the, the more delay, the less happy you are. So basically, think of quality of service as happiness. Okay? I'm going to go through this pretty quickly. I uh, don't want to get too technical. Think of this as. Do you remember Saturday Night Live? There was a character called Father Guido Sarducci. <laughs> so this is five minute, he had this thing called five minute university, five minute economics was buy a low, sell a high. This is a five minute university on streaming, just to set the context. So there were other kinds of QoS that you might want to specify. 
Uh, there may be certain values that are more important, so uh, that, that was how you would deal with that. Turns out, in, in practice, we really only dealt with this one here. Uh, this was a way to, um, to basically get the user to tell you what, what they wanted, OK? So uh, another th something that we studied was uh, load shedding. Nesime Tatbull, who's here somewhere, this was her PhD thesis. And basically, this was a way to, uh, to optimize queries by eliminating the bottleneck by throwing tuples away. So this was an early attempt to do approximate query processing, right? The res if you start throwing tuples away, the result isn't particularly accurate, so you get an approximate result, OK? Um, but it gets worse because the, uh, the network is not always your friend. Things can be delivered in, uh, it be delayed arbitrarily or can be delivered uh, out of order, OK? And basically, that kind of stuff plays havoc with these constructs that we call windows or computing aggregates. OK, so our solution was to basically hand this problem back to the user. And uh, we would uh, basically let the user tell you what, what they wanted. For, for late tuples that arrived, we had this notion called timeout. And timeout basically said that uh, after a certain amount of uh, time goes by, you just close the window. Uh, and you might miss something that's coming later, but it's better to, to not wait forever blocking for something that might never come. We also had this idea of we called slack, and this was essentially saying that if a tuple came early, then you would wait a certain amount of time before you finally decided that it was time to, to switch gears, OK? So uh, th that was sort of the high points of Aurora. Uh, Borealis was Aurora operating on multiple nodes. And so this is a picture that we used a lot. I think Orr came up with this. Are you here, Orr? Yeah, there he is in the back. This was Orr's picture of what Borealis was supposed to look like. OK, so here are the main, I told you that to tell you this. Here are the main uh, technical problems that we addressed. Uh, basically, push-based processing, these notions of windows, which was a way to take a, an unbounded uh, data stream and chop it up into pieces that you could compute with. Um, load shedding, well, I mentioned that. Dealing with disorder, I mentioned that. And this idea that, you know, nothing, no customer that we ever talked to uh, had a pure streaming application. They all required storage of some kind. And so we had a lot of discussion about how to build storage into the streaming system. And I think we might not have actually gotten it right. So we're doing some work now to try to, to get it right and maybe incorporate streaming into a transactional context. OK, Borealis addressed things like load balancing and high availability. And uh, then there was this benchmark. This was an amazing story. So I remember walking through the Stanford campus talking to Mike uh, after an all-day meeting on streaming. And Mike said, you know, the problem is that uh, we don't have a benchmark that people would salute. And so he went home. And over the weekend, he came up with this benchmark that had to do with cars and highways and the, the congestion of cars on the highway would determine the tolls. And back then, people talked about this, but it really didn't exist. And Mike, because he's Mike, turned this into a community accepted uh, benchmark. Uh, I don't know how he did that, but he did. And so you'll hear people do, oops, you'll hear people talk about linear road. That's the linear road benchmark. Mike made it up in two days. And uh, even though it didn't correspond much to reality, people believed it, which is <laughs> pretty cool. Pretty cool. So uh, here's a photograph of the early uh, Aurora Borealis team. You probably recognize some of the faces there. Others you may not. Uh, I don't know what happened to Orr and Mitch. Uh, you weren't there that day, but uh, Orr Chetintamel and Mitch Triniak were definitely part of this group. Um, and one of the most amazing things about this project was we got a lot of students working on it. We had um, this group plus a bunch of other ones. When uh, it was time to commercialize it, we had to make a list of all the students who had worked on it for the purpose of distributing uh, the uh, equity. And I think there were about 20 students on that list. And I, at one of the uh, conferences, Sigmod, I think it was, when we demonstrated the system, uh, Paul Larson came up to me and said, I have one question. How did you keep such a large group, 20 people, order 20 people, together on this one project in a university setting? And I guess the answer that I would give 
is that Mike is such an inspirational guy, and I mean this with all my heart, that he was able to keep the juice flowing in the, in the group together, and that's pretty impressive. So that's the early team. Uh, then we went to demonstrate it at Sigmod, uh, what was this, 06? 05. Sigmod 05. And Mike looked around and noticed that the Berkeley guys had t-shirts that said Berkeley Database Group. And the Stanford guys had t-shirts that said Stanford Database Group. And we needed something to, to basically say who we were. So it was too late to get t-shirts made. So we went to the local mall and we bought these hats. You see the hats? They say Aurora Borealis. And because I'm a pack rat, I still have mine. And uh, thank you, thank you. I won't say who was modeling it there, but uh, you can take a guess. I think you can see some whiskers down here, but that's, that's OK. Anyway, uh, we wore these hats. Here was the demo room. Uh, that's Nesime, that's Eddie, and I don't know who the other people are, but where it was quite, quite well received. And uh, there's Nesime giving the, giving the presentation. Oh, this was, I'm sorry, this was taken at Sigmod 05. I think it was 05. This was that, oh, it says it right there. Sigmod 05, we won the best demo award. Yay. Thank you very much. And here's Mike getting a demo from uh, Yanif Ahmad. And uh, he looks pretty happy. <laughs> But I think something's going on in his head. Something, something is percolating that's beyond just making a good show at Sigmod, right? And here's another picture, and you can see uh, he's, he's pretty happy there. I actually just included this because it's a good picture of Mike. But uh, he's thinking about something. And what could it be? Well, he wanted to, make, to build a company. And uh, the company was based around Aurora, essentially. And you'll notice here that it says, formerly Grassy Brook. Well, what's that all about? Well, we needed a name for the company. And uh, Mike has a, a house up on like, Winnipesaukee, and it was on Grassy Pond Road. He said, well, Grassy Pond, there's a good name. But you know, ponds just kind of sit there. And streams move. So we needed street, grassy, grassy something. What, what moves? Well, Grassy Brook, that sounds good. So Grassy Brook was the first name of Stream Base, and it was named after uh, the street where Mike and family live. Okay, so this was, by the way, this is also a slide from a deck. I didn't just make this up. Now, when you, uh, when you get into a company, and this is what I've learned, um, you have to worry about things beyond just the technology. You have to worry about marketing, for example. So this was my first uh, real immersion in the, in the wonderful world of marketing. And uh, this was one of the slides from our pitch deck. Right? You'll notice that the stick figures that I had on the previous slide have changed, and now we have powerful images like bullet trains, right? <laughs> yeah, that's, that's what we're talking about. And the words are all superlatives, right? They're all very strong language. So, so that, that's what the marketing people uh, teach. Now, this next one, I, I swear this is, this is the truth. You'll remember the picture where I had the streams coming in on one side and the, the answers coming out the other side. Well, our genius marketing people translated that into this. <laughs> this is for real. And, uh, you know, the, what came out the other end wasn't streams, it was just, you know, goodness and, and nirvana and all that good stuff. Okay, so um, I was poking through some other slides from these early pitch decks. And I found one that had Mike's footprints all over it. And that was this. <laughs> and you know, I don't understand what it means exactly. Uh, I'm not sure what an EIA system is, although I looked it up once. And uh, here's the famous quad chart coming back. And we, there was no, no predetermined, uh, this, this was just, it just speaks of Mike, right? And so. Uh, yeah, and so the culmination of all of this um, uh, marketing stuff, in my opinion, was something that was called the Da Vinci Coder. 
And I don't know how many of you people know about this, but I'm going to try here to uh, hopefully this will work. Ah, why am I getting no sound? A battle no. is raged between end users. Where's that project that I needed yesterday? What, does it sound like I care what you think? Huh? Managers. The system is down. Do you have any idea how much this is costing us every second? Ends code. I mean, this code is spaghetti, my friend. You can actually read code. Encoded. Stop working on that urgent project and start working well, on this urgent project. I wish we had time to see the whole thing. Get computers to react thing, instantly to real-time events uh, without custom coding. Come on, let's do this. You can't do this to me. No. No. No! But now the tide has turned. So if we fast forward a little bit here, in C++ or Java, she's... she's... Hey. See that again. Hurry, with no latency. Ah. Hurry, with no latency. Well, you might recognize that gentleman. And uh, so not only is Mike a brilliant computer scientist, but he's an actor. <laughs> we filmed this at a studio somewhere south of here, and uh, it was pretty amazing. And, and just to show you that he likes to share the wealth, if we fast forward a little more. Hold oh, still. Show me the money. Show me the money. It tells me we're getting close. Now where? I will use my superior French well, cryptography. I'm not sure you saw that, but it, couldn't keep right, up with okay. the data rates. Hold still. That's me. <laughs> so I've learned a lot of things from Mike. My life has cha been changed radically because of knowing Mike, but. Uh, really, I mean, he shared his, his moment in the sun on the big screen. And <laughs> I'll be forever grateful to that, Mike. H Hari Balakrishnan was also a monk in this movie. I, I'm not sure where he shows up, but uh, trust me. OK, so uh, let's see. I want to go back to here. OK. <laughs> yeah, I don't know. All right, something's going wrong here. Maybe. Let's try. So let's see. Let's see if this works. Okay, good. So my first story here is Mike, when we finally decided we wanted to commercialize this, we went out to some VCs along 128, and I was with Mike, and uh, we got about halfway through the pitch, and they had their checkbooks out. It was really pretty amazing, and it wasn't because of the pitch, it was because of Mike. Uh, they, they just, they trusted him, they called him a serial entrepreneur, and I had just seen, never seen anything quite, quite like that. Um, once the company got going, we managed to get an audience with uh, CTOs at all the big financial firms in New York City. So I spent a lot of time on trains uh, going to meetings with CTOs to explain the technology. And I learned something very important there, which is that the end users are a lot smarter than university people sometimes like to pretend. They can tell you that's not a problem for us. And oh, but that is, or but you're missing this. So I always went home from these countless train trips a little bit smarter than when I, when I went. So my hat's off to uh, end users. And oh, by the way, Streambase had hats too. <laughs> and uh, the whole thing was, a, was an amazing experience. I learned a lot about business. I learned a lot about um, commercial, the commercial world. And uh, it was really much better than going to Harvard Business School for a couple of years. And, uh, 
none of this would have been possible without Mike. So I seriously want to thank him publicly right now. <laughs> hmm, how did this happen? I think I missed a whole bunch of slides in the middle. Uh, all right. So uh, in any case, um, Mike has a hidden talent. I don't know how many of you know this. Um, he plays the banjo. And you might say, uh, what? The banjo? Everybody knows the banjo is kind of a strange instrument. It's not very popular. It sounds horrible. It's kind of in the same equivalence class with the bagpipe, right? <laughs> So why would Mike, a brilliant computer scientist, and now we know an actor as well, uh, why would he want to play the banjo? And uh, if you were in the bluegrass world for any amount of time, as, as I have spent some time in the bluegrass world, you'll know that all the jokes are about the banjo players. And so just to give you a sense of how this, uh, this stereotype works, and by the way, I'm not accusing Mike of any of this, right? <laughs> So well, here we go. What's the difference between a banjo player and a large pizza? Does anybody know? You can feed people. Sorry? You can feed people. Oh, that's really good. A large pizza could feed a family of four. <laughs> and we know Mike, Mike has no problem feeding a family of four. So that's, that's not it. How about this? How can you tell if the concert stage is level? The banjo player is drooling out of both sides of his mouth. Oh. <laughs> Come on. That's exactly right. Do you play the banjo? No, I play drums. Uh, <laughs> I get it. I get it. OK. Um, wait, wait, Skid, I have to ask, are you playing the bagel? What's that? I just found it. Pull yourself together, Margo. <laughs> <laughs> I'm really curious about this defiant stereotype, because it would suggest to me that you're implying that Mike only drools out of people's mouths. Well, I'm curious about this defiant stereotype. Well, I've never seen Mike drool at all. <laughs> but anyway, so, uh, and, and it gets worse because the mainstream media has picked up on this. So uh, New Yorker magazine is one of my favorite, my favorite cartoons of all time. But as you can see, banjo players get no respect. No respect at all. So uh, why would you want to uh, play the banjo? I mean, it's a good question, right? And I, was, I asked myself that about Mike. And you know, if you, know, if you look around these days, there are some pretty high profile banjo players in the world. You I mean, you all recognize these, these folks, and they're both playing the banjo, and they're looking pretty good there. And I think that Mike just wants a piece of the action. You know? So uh, he took up the banjo and uh, organized a bluegrass jam among uh, a few of his friends, including myself. And uh, every two to three weeks, we get together in the stream-based conference room. There's a little uh, link to the previous stuff, right? Stream-based conference room. Started it back in the Vertica days. And we even had one public appearance. Yep, that's true. And anybody want to guess what we called ourselves? <laughs> that's good. We're going to remember that. Any other guesses? Okay. Resumed a ball. <laughs> yeah, we call ourselves. <laughs> and uh, that's it. So uh, here's a picture of Mike with his banjo. I think this may be the only picture on the planet of Mike holding his banjo. So this is rare, rare stuff. Um, and I'm going to. He has more than one banjo, it's true. Uh, but then again, people who are into this music tend to have more than one of what they play. I'm not going to tell you how many mandolins I have. Uh, so uh, there's Mike. I'm going to introduce you to the rest of the band here. It's not really a band. It's a jam session. This is J.R. Robinson. He was a former uh, Vertica engineer. And by the way, the original idea was we were going to smuggle a banjo in here, right? And we were going to surprise Mike and say, OK, here you go. Let's play something. But it turns out that J.R. Robinson, who's our lead singer and rhythm guy, uh, couldn't make it. So that, that idea went out the window. But hang on for a minute, because there's more to be told. Uh, Robert Hoffman, former stream, stream bass engineer, he comes most of the time, not all the time, because uh, he's a very much in demand symphony bass player. And so he's been sitting in with us playing this I don't know, bluegrass music. 
And he's just getting used to the idea that bluegrass musicians don't use sheet music. <laughs> and so he's just kind of adapting to that. But he's, uh, he's been a good addition to the, to the group. Uh, that's me. That's, that's m that funny looking instrument that I have. That's a mandolin as conceived by the Gibson Company in the 1920s. And occasionally we have this guy sitting with us, Dave Reiner. Does anybody here know Dave Reiner? Yeah, so, some of you folks do. And just to, for those of you who don't know him, if you're worried that maybe he doesn't have the database cred to join this, this group, yeah, he's got some papers. Huh? <laughs> and he was doing parallel computing actually before a lot of us were. So he's OK. He's a, good, he's a very good fiddle player. He forces us to up our game. And uh, he, he comes every now and then. And uh, <laughs> just to um, pull back the curtain a little bit, um, I hope this works. Let's see. Yeah, right. But it's not showing, on, the cursor is not showing on my screen. This is us playing last Tuesday night. That's Mike. Creek, in case you don't recognize it. <laughs> That was recorded, by the way, on my iPhone. I turned it on and uh, surreptitiously grabbed a little bit of, uh, of the, what we were doing. And uh, as you can see, Mike's a, a pretty good banjo player. So uh, another talent, brilliant computer scientist, actor, musician. Wow. <laughs> and that. So I think that's the end. I'm not sure why. I'm, there's a few slides I missed in the middle, uh, but I think that'll, that'll suffice for now. <laughs> Thanks.